Homo sapiens. Who are we? Where do we come from? In chapter 12, we will continue our investigation into the demise of the Neanderthals and the movement of Homo sapiens or modern humans as they push northward out of Africa into Eurasia. We will be focusing on the time frame of 130,000 years ago to 35,000 years ago. During this roughly 100,000 year span, the Neanderthals went from a position of dominance in Europe to virtual extinction. Let's start by taking a look at the geographic nexus between Neanderthals and modern humans, the Levant. The Levant is the historic name of the area at the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea, which comprises in part northern Egypt, Israel, Palestine, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and southern Turkey. The term Levant derives from the French word Levant, meaning rising. To Western European sailors and maritime traders, the Levant signified the lands to their east, which they associated with the rising sun. The term Levant was incorporated into archaeological usage in the 1800s to refer to this area where overlapping prehistoric cultures were being discovered. The Levant forms a geographic bridge between Africa and Eurasia. It is also an area where Neanderthals and modern humans were in direct competition for thousands of years. Archaeological evidence shows that the Levant underwent several changes in occupation between populations of Neanderthals and modern humans over the period from 130,000 years ago to 35,000 years ago. If we look at this graphic of the timeline of the Levantine occupation, we can see that from 130,000 years ago to 80,000 years ago, the Levant was dominated by modern humans. From the span of 75,000 to 47,000 years ago, the Neanderthals dominated the Levant. Around 47,000 years ago to 40,000 years ago, modern humans moved back into the Levant. Over the time span of 45,000 to 35,000 years ago, the Neanderthals disappeared from the Levantine archaeological record. By the 30,000 year mark, Neanderthal remains disappear from the European archaeological record. Before we delve into the possible reasons for this population flux in the Levant, let's familiarize ourselves with some of the more prominent archaeological sites in the Levantine area. Looking at a map of the Levant, some of the important sites in Israel would include Kibara, Skul, Tabun, Kafsa, Hayonim, and Amud. In Lebanon, we have an important site at Nahir Ibrahim. In Syria, we have sites at Dedaria, Duara, El Kawan, and Um El Talal. These areas represent some of the most significant sites associated with remains of Neanderthals and modern humans in the Levant. We will look at a few of these sites in more detail, but for the moment, let's turn our attention to the population flux in the Levant. One of the explanations for the Levantine population changes over the period of 130,000 to 40,000 years ago is tied to changes in the climate. But how exactly can scientists determine ancient climatic conditions? Let's digress for a moment for some insight into how scientists determine the nature of paleoclimates. One of the ways scientists have for determining ancient or paleoclimatic conditions is from studying deep sea cores and inland ice cores. Deep sea cores drilled from the ocean bottom can be thought of as representing a record of oceanic chemistry. This record can be read in the ocean bed sediments rich in the calcite composed shells of marine organisms which have collected on the ocean bottom over thousands and millions of years. Ice cores drilled from glaciers or ice sheets on land can be thought of as comprising a record of the chemistry of atmospheric precipitation captured in the layers of ice over thousands of years. The key to reading these records of paleoclimate is found in the ratio of two oxygen isotopes, namely oxygen-16 and oxygen-18, which are part of the chemical composition of the ice in ice cores and the calcite shells of marine organisms. Isotopes are variations of an element based on the number of neutrons in the nucleus. Both isotopes of oxygen have eight protons, but oxygen-16 has eight neutrons, while oxygen-18 has ten neutrons. The sum of protons and neutrons in the atomic nucleus is called the atomic mass number, from which the oxygen-16 and oxygen-18 designations are derived. Over many years of research and study, it was determined 
that the ratio of oxygen 16 to oxygen 18 in core samples was dependent on temperature and the size of major continental ice sheets. During cold or glacial periods, the ice core samples were found to be diminished in oxygen 18 in relation to oxygen 16. During cold or glacial periods, deep sea cores displayed just the opposite. Oxygen 18 was enriched in relation to oxygen 16. This was due to oxygen 16 evaporating from the oceans more readily than oxygen 18 during cold periods. The result was that precipitation falling over land was oxygen 16 enriched relative to oxygen 18, while in the oceans, oxygen 18 was enriched relative to oxygen 16. During the warm or interglacial periods, the results would flip. Ice cores would be oxygen 18 enriched in relation to oxygen 16, while deep sea cores showed oxygen 18 diminished in relation to oxygen 16. This was due to the fact that during warm periods there was more heat energy at work to facilitate the evaporation of oxygen 18 into the atmosphere. To put it succinctly, deep sea cores show oxygen 18 enrichment during cold periods and oxygen 18 reduction during warm periods relative to oxygen 16. Using this knowledge, scientists work to create a chronology of climatic change based on deep sea cores. This chronology is designated the marine isotope stages or the oxygen isotope stages. The chronology begins with marine isotope stage 1, which covers the last 11,000 years with the beginning of the Holocene. Currently, 100 stages have been identified going back about 6 million years. The odd number stages represent warm or interglacial periods with low oxygen-18 ratios. The even number stages represent cold or glacial periods with high oxygen-18 ratios. Marine isotope stages 3 through 5 will be of interest to us when looking at the Levantine population flux from 130,000 years ago to 35,000 years ago. If we look at this graph of oxygen isotope ratios over the last 500,000 years, we can get an idea of the climatic fluctuations that impacted the evolving species of the genus Homo. The larger the oxygen isotope index number, the colder the climate. The lower the number, the warmer the climate. Though there would have been some variance across the Earth's surface during the glacial and interglacial periods, we can match up the European or Alpine ice ages to the oxygen isotope index. Namely, we are talking about the Mendel, Riss, and Verm ice ages and their interglacial periods ending with the current geologic period, the Holocene. Work is still ongoing in correlating the chronologies of these various dating methods, but in general we can see there is a good matchup between the marine isotope stages and the older ice age dating. Let's see how these fluctuations in climate match up to the population fluctuations in the Levant. The time period we are looking at is from 130,000 years ago to about 30,000 years ago. This gives us a time span of 100,000 years. Let's see how the fluctuations in the Levantine population of Neanderthals and modern humans matches up to the changes in climate of the Levant during this time span. As we looked at earlier, the Levant was dominated by modern humans from 130,000 years ago to 80,000 years ago. By the 75,000 year mark to the 47,000 year mark, Neanderthals dominated the Levant. From 47,000 years ago to 40,000 years ago, modern humans moved back into the Levant. If we overlay these time frames with the marine isotope stage information, we can begin to see how climate variation may have impacted the population fluctuations in the Levant. Marine isotope stage 5 was a period of warm and humid climatic conditions. Marine isotope stage 5 dates from about the 130,000 year mark to around the 73,000 year mark. We can see from our graph that this is about the time frame in which modern humans dominated the Levant. Conditions north of the Levant into Europe would have been warmer and less harsh for the Neanderthal populations living there. This would have allowed Neanderthal populations to expand northward as the climate warmed. Marine isotope stage 4 runs roughly from the 74,000 year mark to around the 59,000 year mark. Climatic conditions would have turned colder and drier in the Levant. Climatic conditions north of the Levant would have become harsher for the Neanderthal populations. These harsher conditions may have caused the Neanderthals to move southward into the Levant where living conditions were more favorable. Modern humans retreated southward into Africa during marine isotope stage 4 as a colder and drier climate took hold. 
the dynamics of this population change in the Levant over the roughly 6,000 year span from 80,000 years ago to 74,000 years ago was no doubt impacted by a combination of elements. Climate may have been the driving factor. Climate change impacts vegetation and animal populations. These in turn would have affected the populations of modern humans and Neanderthals who depended on plant and animal resources to survive. Marine Isotope Stage 3 runs from roughly 59,000 to 27,000 years ago. This would have been a time of warming, but not as warm or as humid as Marine Isotope Stage 5. During Marine Isotope Stage 3, around the 47,000 year mark, we begin to see modern humans moving back into the Levant. Neanderthal populations are slowly pushed or move out of the Levant till around the 40,000 year mark, we no longer find Neanderthals in the Levant. The timeline of Levantine occupation and climate flux seems to support the idea that climate played a role in the population movements. As we've seen in past chapters, Neanderthals were better adapted to cold weather and modern humans to warm weather. These adaptations may have played a role in population movements tied to climate. It is also likely that modern humans began to use their technological prowess to find ways of adapting to colder climates thus extending their ability to push northward into Eurasia where colder climatic conditions existed. Neanderthals and modern humans also had different styles of habitation and logistics. These different paradigms impacted survival and adaptation to change. This dichotomy in habitation styles may also point to behavioral differences that impacted evolutionary survival. Neanderthals tended to be long-term inhabitants of a site where they found a favorable location or cave and inhabited that site for long stretches of time. They exploited the resources in the surrounding area fanning out from their central habitation center. Modern humans, on the other hand, tended to change habitation sites as the seasons changed. They sought out the protection of caves largely in the winter months. This seasonal or opportunistic habitation strategy gave modern humans the flexibility to move to a variety of food resources as they became available or were in season. The flexibility and adaptability of modern humans is one behavioral difference that may have given them an advantage over their Neanderthal cousins, as in the long run, modern humans flourished and Neanderthals perished. One thing to keep in mind is that these population changes are taking place over many thousands of years. The exact details stimulating these changes will probably never be known. We can only extrapolate estimations from the archaeological record. Let's now take a more detailed look at a few of the important archaeological sites in the Levantine area. We will look at two important archaeological sites in the Levantine area. The first site will be the Kabar Cave Site, an archaeological site located on the Carmel Range about 10 kilometers northeast of Caesarea. The oldest occupation levels of the Kabar site were dated between 60,000 to 48,000 years ago. These early occupations were by Neanderthals. Excavations at Kabara in 1983 uncovered one of the most complete Neanderthal skeletons ever found. The skeleton designated KMH2 was the remains of an adult Neanderthal male between 25 to 35 years old. The Kabara II skeleton was dated to approximately 60,000 years ago. The positioning of the skeleton and the lack of disturbance to the remains seems to point to the probability of a burial. Also found in the Kabar cave were the bones of mountain gazelle and Persian fallow deer bearing cut marks. Evidence of hearths, burned bones, and stone tools were also discovered at Kabara. The partial remains of numerous other Neanderthal individuals were found in the cave. Evidence was found for the use of plant resources in the form of legumes, acorns, and pistachio nuts. There was also evidence of Neanderthals consuming tortoises. It is thought that the tortoise shells may have been used as containers. Stone tools in the Mousterian tradition characteristic of the Neanderthal populations in Europe and West Asia were uncovered at the Kabara site. The raw material for making the stone tools seems to have been brought in from a distance of about 5 kilometers away. The Kabara site has given researchers valuable insight into the way Neanderthals lived and utilized the resources in their area. The second site we will look at is the Dedaria Cave site in northern Syria. The most important find from the Dedaria cave site was uncovered in 1993 by a joint Japanese and Syrian research team. The discovery was an almost complete skeleton of a Neanderthal child, estimated to be about two years old. The remains were dated to a range of 50,000 to 70,000 years in the past. The child appears to have been buried with a roughly rectangular limestone slab 
placed at the top of the child's head and a small triangular piece of flint situated near the child's heart. Studies of the Neanderthal child's leg bones seems to indicate that Neanderthal children grew at a rate similar to the children of modern humans. This would have allowed for an extended childhood which meant Neanderthal parents spent the same time and resources in raising their children as did modern humans, a further indicator that Neanderthals and modern humans shared similar lifestyles. The archaeological sites of the Levant have been of key importance in providing valuable information on how Neanderthals and modern humans lived their lives thousands of years in the past. There is still much to cover in our look at Neanderthals and modern humans. What is the evidence for possible interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans? And the mystery of the Denisovans provides fertile ground we have yet touched on in any detail. In chapter 13, we will continue our quest to answer these questions.